turn that on. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Thank you. And thank you, Emily, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for showing up to, um, to listen to me talk today. Um, so, yeah, my, my name is Aaron Weinberg, as uh, Emily said, and I work for TED's tech team. And basically, we're responsible for providing products and uh, delivery mechanisms to bring TED content out to uh, the whole world. So, uh, mainly, I work on TED.com, but we handle other platforms, uh, Android, iOS, TV apps, stuff like that. Um, as well. Sometimes people ask me what the most popular TED Talk of all time is, and the answer actually is this one. It's by Ken Robinson. Has anyone ever seen this talk by Ken Robinson? Awesome to see hands out there. That's great. Um, so he, he gives a talk about education and why we need to sort of shift how we think about um, assigning kids into categories like, or, or overweighting categories like math and science and underweighting stuff like the arts and dance and humanities and stuff like that. So, so he's talking about ways to sort of retool our education system to prepare kids and ourselves for a future that, quite frankly, uh, none of us can even really imagine what it would be like um, in the future. So to quantify how popular or how viewed this talk is, it's about 39 million views right now, which sounds like a lot. It is a lot, actually. Uh, the talk came out about um, 10 years ago. It's, he gave it in 2006. It's a lot of views, but really is it a lot? Because when you think about <laughs> YouTube's most popular piece of content, it's, it's many multiples, like 60 or 70 times that, which is really, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I'm being honest, I'm, it, my heart sinks with uh, <laughs> sadness and humility when I think about other forms of attention that we're competing against. But we still actually still pretty good because if you consider the whole volume of TED content, the whole catalog of all the talks, which actually isn't that many, but all of them together account for about right around 4 billion views. It's tough to, to accurately count across the whole ecosystem, but it's right around <clears throat> that mark. So um, so that's, that's really great. But I didn't want to talk about the talks or myself or what my team is doing or any of that stuff. I actually wanted to talk about my team itself and why I think they work so well together and why they're sort of happy with what they're doing, why they stick together. And I started thinking about this about six months or so ago. I was on a flight back from uh, San Diego, coming back here to New York. And as I do on those long flights, I like to get up from my seat and kind of walk around. And I walk to the back galley and stretch my legs and kind of keep the blood flowing. It's, I mean, being tall, it's a struggle sometimes on those long flights. But anyway, on my way back to my seat, I was sort of noting how people were spending their time. Some people were reading books or watching movies or kind of trying to sleep in awkward positions. Then I saw these two guys here. They're pair programming. And I sort of snuck this picture surreptitiously. And I know these guys. Um, Sam and Ryan are, uh, is their names. And I work with them. They're great guys. Actually, there were six other people on this flight that I work with. We were all on our way back from an off-site meeting where we spent four days together in a room and when I say four days, I really mean four solid 16-hour days uh, at this off-site meeting. And what struck me about this moment was not only are these guys not sick of each other, they still have enough energy and motivation to, to work on a problem together, and, you know, as opposed to just going to sleep or doing something else. So I went back to my seat, and I thought about this moment and just generally why my team is, is happy and why they work so well together over the years. So when I think about that, I'm reminded of a book that I read recently by Margaret Heffernan. She's also a TED speaker, by the way. And in that book, she says, culture has become the secret sauce of organizational life. It's the thing that makes the difference, but no one has a recipe for this. So I sat back down in my seat, and I kind of pondered on this for the rest of the flight. And I thought, if there, if there is a recipe or if there is sort of this secret sauce, what would, what would go into that? Um, so I thought about some stuff, and I thought about um, just general observations about my team that I've seen at TED over the past four and a half years or so that I've been there. So I want to spend the rest of my time up here talking to you today about what those things are, and hopefully you can take a few of these things, apply them to what you do in your day-to-day -day life and the products you build or uh, the teams that you work on and, and so forth. Um, and I wanted to start generally with this idea of culture uh, in general. And I think that, I really do believe that cultures, the best cultures are, they're not a byproduct. They're not just something that kind of emerges over time. 
uh, or just kind of happens to you. I think they can be architected. I think they can be sort of crafted and, and, uh, and designed to, to a degree. Um, there's two things about TED's culture that I've noticed over the years that I want to make sure that I underline and, and highlight specifically. The first is about um, actually gender uh, diversity and gender balance on our team. TED is about 65% female, TED at large. There's about 160 employees at TED. So that's fantastic. The tech team that I'm on is not anywhere near that. We're about 20, between 20 and 25%. We have a long way to go. Um, we're, we'll get there, but one of the reasons why I know that we will get there is that we're, we're trying to craft a culture that's very inviting to women on the team, and we know that because we hear stuff about it. Uh, one of our engineers remarked to me that it's the best, uh, it's the most comfortable and welcome, welcoming team that she's been a part of, and that really matters to us when we hear that kind of thing. Uh, it signals to us that we're trying to, not even trying to, we are creating a culture where it's inviting for women to be part of a tech team um, it's important for us uh, to do that. So we've got a long way to go to get to, to where I think we probably should be, but I think a prerequisite to getting there is having, uh, cr creating a team where you can at least talk about it openly without penalty or without, uh, without it being discouraged. Um, because if that can't happen, we'll never, we'll never get there. So that's something we definitely try uh, and, and encourage on our team is to just talk about it and have it top of people's minds as we grow the team. Other thing about our team that I want to make um, sure that I hit on is that if there's one through line to everybody on my team, nobody has a huge ego on, on our team. Um, sometimes the best example is to show an anti-example, which is why I'm showing that slide. But um, there's a lot of people on my team that are really smart. They're, they're either at the top or on their way to the top of their craft. Not anybody would ever say they're the smartest person in the room, every success I've seen at TED has come from a place of, um, not rather from a place of certainty, but from a place of um, humility and willingness to be wrong and openness to new evidence and not being the loudest voice in the room and kind of listening to the softer voices. Um, so then, if the kind of culture I'm talking about, the kind of culture I'm describing is um, sort of driven by its people, then it really matters who you bring on the team, how you grow this team. It really, um, it's worth investing in that, and we make sure that, um, that we do that. And one of the ways that we do that is we sort of over-index for niceness, I guess, or uh, motivation, and under-index slightly for skills. So I'm reminded, though, every time I think about that, of Simon Sinek. He, he wrote a book called Start With Why. He also has a couple TED Talks now. And he says, great companies don't hire skilled people and then motivate them. They try and find people that are already sort of pre-motivated and then inspire those people to go forth and, um, and contribute to the team. Notice the, the second sentence doesn't mention skills at all there, which is kind of notable to me. And furthermore, it doesn't, if, if, even if you find the most brilliant unicorn ever, it doesn't matter if that person's really difficult to work with. And Jessica Walsh, I saw her quoted in Fast Company recently, she was giving advice to uh, young designers looking for uh, a job and to start their career. She's like, don't be an asshole, be nice, no one likes to work with you if you are, don't be an egomaniac, no matter how talented you are. That's super important to us. And we have at least three rounds of interviews that we put people through at TED. It's like a, it's a long car wash, I call it. There's at least 15 people involved in this. We're very invested. It takes us a lot of time away from what we're doing to sort of interview. We're all involved in the interview process. Sometimes as many as 20 people are involved in interviewing people that are, that are candidates. And so if, you're, if you register any non-zero amount on any of these scales that we don't want, we're probably going to figure that out at some point. It's just going to come out, um, and that's, that's definitely something we try and, and filter for. There's two other ways that help us find the right people to join TED. And actually, on paper, they don't, they don't look very good. They could be considered sort of inbuilt weaknesses of TED, but I think they're strengths, and I'll kind of explain why I think they are. I'll just go through them one by one. One is, is sort of derived from the fact that TED, I'm not sure everybody knows this, but TED is a nonprofit company. And despite what it costs to go to a TED conference, it's, it's absurd. It's off the charts. Every dollar that comes in, whether it be from conference revenues or other forms of revenue, all that money goes straight back into furthering the, the mission of TED, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers from falling down, 
paying other people, stuff like that. It's really expensive, actually, to serve your own media. Um, Spotify probably knows that. Um, so yeah, our finances are open. You can go look this stuff, uh, all this stuff up if you want to. And, but the thing about this is it tends to result in, I'll just say it this way, you can, you can probably find, not probably, likely find a higher salary position in, a, in the for-profit tech sector than you can at a place like that. Just, it's just a fact. So we're, we don't obscure that fact at all. We, we sort of present the total package of what TED is and what we offer and what it's like to work there, and money's not the top reason, and we just want, kind of want to make sure that that is... Um, but that is known. The other reason why, uh, the other reason that could be considered sort of a weakness is the fact that TED is still kind of a flat, small organization, so people concerned with ladder climbing and, and their job titles and stuff like that probably won't find a whole lot of clear paths upward in an organization like us where we're still very small. So you kind of have to love what you're doing when you get there um, or, you know, or, or the person may not, might not be totally satisfied. Uh, and what they're doing. So, and I'll kind of touch on this a little bit later. So those two reasons, base compensation, upward mobility, we'll call it, those two things kind of are off-putting to some people. And honestly, they're kind of off-putting to maybe the right people who wouldn't otherwise fit in the, the kinds of things we're trying to prioritize anyway. Um, so I think, I think they're actually positives um, in, in that regard. So uh, if, then, the culture that I'm describing is driven and kind of defined and, and propelled and fueled by the kind of people that you have, what if those people are all just scattered all over the place? And our team is really distributed. We have people in, in Australia, engineers in Canada, every time zone uh, in the U.S. How do you work to create kind of a, a connected culture under those conditions? We use some of the same tools that you guys use, uh, group chat, uh, you know, video conferencing stuff. That's all really um, helpful, but there's, there's one thing. I'm going to go back to Margaret Heffernan again on this, and she says something really, I want to make sure that I don't screw this up. She says, if there's a single diagnostic indicator of a healthy workplace, it just may be the quality of connectedness. So that's why we think it's really super important to stay connected as a team, and we find several ways to do that uh, at TED. One of them is that a lot of us go to the TED conference itself. It's held in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia every year, and it has been for the past couple years and several to come. It's a beautiful venue. Uh, I love it there. It didn't always look like that, though. This is what it least looked like back in about 2001. Actually, uh, it started in Monterey, California for many years. It was a closed conference. Kind of the, the talks that were given there stayed there. It didn't really open up until uh, several years after it was uh, the talks were given. This picture, I think, is from 2006. And there's Al Gore in the corner there. I circled him for you. Um, this is what the conference looks like today. This is the stage area. It's, as you can see, it's a lot more grown up. It's a lot more polished. The production value is it's multiples of what it was. It's a totally different experience. And Al Gore still goes to the conference. <laughs> he, he likes to go. He's been, he's been there for uh, quite a few years. But he's an attendee. And when we go to the conference, we're not attendees at all. We're very much in a staff experience. It's, it's a lot of work. The, the days are long. We don't get a whole lot of sleep. Stuff breaks. You have to fix things. We have to respond to things that change all the time. I like this picture because some of our ops engineers trying to figure out a problem before the conference even started. This is in Edinburgh, Scotland, a few years ago when we used to have a, a TED Global conference there. And um, so when, when you're sort of under those stressful conditions for that long, the conference is a week long, it tends to have this unifying effect for us. And we, we sort of bring those experiences back to our day-to-day -day work after the conference is over. And it kind of has this, um, this bonding effect to people that kind of go through stuff together. Also, at the conference, we feel really connected. It's a great chance to, to be connected and up close to the genesis of our own content. Like, the, the thing that we are working so hard to put out into the world, and it's nice to kind of see that happen. And we bring those experiences right back to the office, and it just kind of keeps us going throughout uh, the year. Another way we keep connected as a team is we have annual retreats. There's three days. There's three, day long, uh, three days and two nights long. We bring everybody uh, in the organization. There's about 165 of us now. We all come together once a year. We give talks to one another. We, uh, we discuss. We, we reconnect with the mission. We brainstorm on new ways to move the company forward and solve problems and plan for the future. 
uh, we talk about all kinds of things and generally sort of bond as a group and sort of start building this, this idea of social capital, uh, which I'll, I'll talk to you uh, more a little bit later. Um, it's, there's even a talent show on the third night of this or the second night. It's legendary. The talent on my team is astonishing. It's crazy. Um, we also do these little meetings in the office. We call them all hands meetings. We bring everybody together. They're aimed at sort of the same kinds of goals. These are a little bit more structured. There's a host, there's a running order, there's like a time timer thing. It's sort of like a micro conference actually in itself. And we do these a few times every year. Um, they're really, they're really fantastic. And the third way is this is a little bit more unique to my team in, in the tech group at TED. And, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning with the, the summits and um, the one in San Diego that I referred to. We have had maybe eight or nine of these so far. We do these twice a year. And this one I think is from San Diego. This is where we're, um, I'm not sure what we're talking about here. It's probably something, looks like something kind of serious. But um, these are instrumental for us. I don't know I can't imagine not doing these. It's really expensive to fly 30 people somewhere for four days. Uh, but I think it's more expensive not to do that, actually. Um, it's hard to measure that. It's probably impossible to, but I um, actually can't imagine it. So um, other people at the company have sort of, they start to adopt what we're doing on the tech team and kind of bring those methodologies into their own uh, groups because it's been working so well uh, for us. So we built up all this social capital that I mentioned needs to go somewhere. It needs to be spent on something, and hopefully something purposeful. And um, that kind of leads me to, to the last little bit of my secret sauce recipe sort of thing. And that is that I really think that devoted teams believe in, in why they're doing what they're doing more than anything else, more than the what or how they're going to do it. Um, and by, by, by why, I don't mean this product fills a market space, or uh, your skills are a perfect match for a company I'm looking for somebody just like you. Those are, those are wise, and those are, that's just how things work. Um, but what I'm, what I'm talking about is a little bit of a, like, like a higher altitude view of what it is that you're trying to do, what, what your product is trying, what, it's a reason for existing. So what future state are you trying to achieve? And who is going to benefit from that. And actually, even tough questions like, who might pay a price if this thing succeeds? You know, questions like that. So, and I want to end with this one because it's, it resonates with me personally, and, and I think that if you kind of took this one away, the rest of them kind of, it doesn't have something, it's kind of the foundation for, for the others. I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not good in the kitchen, but whatever, like a, whatever the base is for something, like that, that would be it. Um, so, I want to talk about, I didn't want to go to that slide just yet. <laughs> I totally ruined uh, the reveal. Okay. Um, so, I think now you're like, what is that going to be? Um, so, I, I think the best way to describe this is just sort of to share a personal perspective on it. And um, so, well, well, about how many years ago? Not more than a couple, not too many years ago, I was working at a very small startup, and it was, it was actually awesome. I loved all my coworkers. They were really talented. We had an awesome space, not quite this ridiculous, but uh, it was cool. Uh, we had a pool table. That was fun. Um, it was a flexible environment. I got to work from other countries. It was fantastic. I loved it. We also had a lot of reasons to succeed. We, had, we were well-funded. Um, our idea was super fresh in a wide open market. Nobody was doing the things that we were doing. We had good PR coverage, we were well connected, like we had all these reasons to succeed, and yet when we launched the product, it just kind of, it wasn't the home run that we thought it was going to be, it kind of just languished in, there it is, in uh, this thing that Eric Reese calls in his book, uh, The Lean Startup, everybody read that by the way, if, if you haven't read, read, read that, please read it, he calls this, this state the land of the living dead, so we really, the product wasn't really dying, but it wasn't certainly wasn't succeeding. It was just kind of going along, consuming resources, just kind of wandering around, and developers came and went, and so it was just this kind of um, soulless space where uh, what, we, what we were so psyched about didn't really work, work out. So, just for fun, I went on Quora, and I wanted to see what Quora users thought were the reasons why startups don't succeed, and this is kind of what I found. These are all correct, by the way. These are all right 
in their own way. Any one of these things could sink a startup effort, in my opinion. Um, but I choose to look at this at, from a little bit more of a fundamental perspective, and that is, again, why you're doing what you're doing. At, at the startup, I knew exactly exactly what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. It was, just like a, it was just a matter of execution. At TED, I knew it was actually the opposite, the total inverse of that. I knew why I wanted to be there, for sure, but I had no idea what I was going to do and how I was going to achieve what was being asked of me. I, I had imposter syndrome from day one there. I still kind of have it sometimes when I show up to work. And at the startup, there was an argument building in my head that this thing that we were working so hard to make, uh, the world that I wanted to live in, I, I think it would be better off if this thing never existed, which is like not a good thing to be thinking about when you're working all day and night on something. And at TED, I, again, reverse. I knew exactly why it existed, and I believed in what, in what they were trying to do. By the way, that's not unique to me. Everybody at that organization knows exactly what it is we're up to. Ask anyone there, hey, what are you guys, what are you guys trying to do? What's the mission of this place? They might use slightly different language to articulate it or use different words that, that vary slightly, but the through line is very straight. The spirit of the answers that you'll get is very consistent, and that is to, to find and harvest the best ideas that we can and bring them out uh, to the world via our platform. That's it. That's what we're doing. And uh, when I think about um, all those things together, uh, I have, I'm going to come back to Simon Sinek on this because he, he just says this so eloquently. I can't improve on this. So he says, if you hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. Yes. If you hire people who believe with, with – they're aligned with what you want to do. They believe what you believe. They'll work for you with blood, sweat, and tears. And when I read that the first time, or maybe I heard it, I thought that it sounded really hyperbolic and kind of sensational to me. And I know that it isn't because I've been on exactly both sides of this. I can look at it from both, uh, both pers perspectives. And I think, I'm going to take it even further, I think users can sense it. I think they know when they're interacting with something that's built by someone or a group of people who really, really care about it and are invested in its, in its success. That's why when sometimes when I show up to work, there's stuff like this stuck to the fridge. This is actually a bug report. I have these printed out somewhere. I want to read just a few of these. So this is, this is actually meant to collect like feedback, like what's not working and uh, you know, things that are broken on the site. Anyway, this is from Allison. She says, hey, I want, just want to say thanks for this extraordinary service. I've watched several talks. Some of them have helped me to make some life-changing decisions. And I was, I was actually having kind of a shitty day when I showed up to work and I read that. Like, it kind of turned everything around uh, for me. Here's another one. It's from a middle school student named Emily. She's like, Hey, you encouraged me to be a thinker. I will continue to learn and grow from you and spread my ideas too because you have taught me that a single idea can make a really big difference. And people even write, who, who handwrites anything anymore? And this is a BYU student, and he says, your organization provokes thought and inspires passion. You're making a difference to your mission. Okay, yeah, yeah, you get the idea. And I don't know if, would we be getting the kind of letters like that if, if you took some of these items away? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But this is kind of, it's less of a recipe, I guess, and more of a, a set of observations over the past few years. And, you know, maybe if Sam and Ryan in that picture, maybe if they decided to go to sleep or just watch movies or just not do this on that flight back, maybe we wouldn't get the kind of letters that we get on the fridge every day. I don't know. Um, hard to say. But anyway, hopefully you can take at least some of this some of these stories and, and bring it into whatever it is uh, that you're doing. So thank you so much, Emily, wherever you are back there for having me. I really appreciate the invitation, all of you, for showing up and, and listening to me. So happy to answer questions about anything I said or whatever comes to mind. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.